marine life exerts a strong influence on climate. So at the moment, the influence is quite stable. That even though we have this changing climate, mm. the role of marine life in the carbon cycle seems to have been relatively steady over that period. And so most of the carbon that we have released by doing things like burning fossil fuels, when that's gone into the ocean, it's gone in through largely sort of physical chemical processes, nice. just sort of absorbing in there. Welcome back to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast, where we talk to the people leading the way in raising the profile of the ocean through research, exploration and advocacy. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, I'm Dr Zoe Jacobs and joining me today is Dr Adrian Martin to talk about how marine organisms may influence our climate. So hello Adrian, thanks so much for joining me today. So before we get into the details, I wanted to find out a bit about your journey to NOC. Um, have you always been interested in the oceans? Oh, well, thank you for having me on first. Uh, no, I think is a simple <laughs> answer. Um, I originally trained as a mathematician. Oh, okay. So yeah, I went on from doing maths at university uh, into theoretical cosmology, uh, which I predicted the end of the universe as part of my thesis. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, obviously got it wrong, decided it was time <laughs> for another job. And so I then moved into oceanography soon after that. That's probably the best answer I've had on this podcast. Ah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what about your career path to NOC? It was fairly direct in that when I, when I was doing my PhD, <clears throat> I, I realised that I wanted to do something that was more environmental. Mm. So I had a very understanding supervisor who, rather than having me sort of hung outside the building as somebody who was sort of leaving the field, um, <laughs> said, you know, you need to talk to these people. Yeah. Um, one of them was uh, John Shepherd, who was going to be the new director of what was then the Southampton Oceanography Centre. Mm -hmm. He just floated the CV around and I got contacted by a couple of people who said, yeah, come down and have a chat. And I've been here since, since the building opened in 95. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. A long time. Um and what is actually, what is your role at NOC and what does it entail kind of day to day? So I sit in the what's called the Marine Systems Modelling mm -hmm. Group, which is the group that tries to capture our understanding of the ocean in computer models. And that allows us to sort of fill in the gaps to test whether what we think we know is actually robust and also to make predictions. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I originally came down to NOC to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've rapidly got sidetracked. So I've done a variety <laughs> of things since as well. Yeah. As so happens. Yes, <laughs> as it seems yeah. to be the norm. Seems <laughs> exactly. to be the norm. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start with a big, broad question. Um, can you explain why the ocean is relevant to our climate? Yes. So I guess it may not necessarily seem obvious. So water is very good at absorbing carbon dioxide. And so we all know this because fizzy drinks, you know, that's exactly how they create them. They mm -hmm. just force a lot of carbon dioxide into a tin of water, basically. And so having an ocean which occupies 70% of the surface of the Earth mm. underneath the atmosphere means that it absorbs carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so atmospheric carbon dioxide, you know, we think it's high now, and it is, mm. but it would actually be a lot higher if the ocean wasn't taking some of that CO2 out of the atmosphere and absorbing it. And we know that the ocean has 50 times more carbon in it than in the atmosphere. So we know it's a huge reservoir. Yeah. And because of that ability to take carbon dioxide, we know that it has a very important role in terms of climate. Mm. Mm. Interesting. And what role does marine life play in this? So this is interesting. So this, uh, I think, is some people might think it's a bit counterintuitive that you yeah. can have things like, you know, tiny plankton or fish influencing climate. Yeah. But it goes to this way in which water can absorb carbon dioxide. Mm. So if you have the atmosphere sitting on top of the ocean, yeah. you have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it gradually sort of moves into the ocean. Mm. The amount of carbon moving into the ocean is determined by how much you've got in the surface ocean. Okay. So if you end up with lots of carbon dioxide in the surface ocean, mm. then it makes it more difficult for more carbon dioxide to come in. Mm, I see. So you either need to move it away from the surface mm. or you need to put it into a form which is no longer an obstacle to the stuff coming in. Mm. And so marine life can do that in two ways. Mm -hmm. The first one is that if you take carbon dioxide and you turn it into living material, mm. so, you know, humans are 20% carbon, so, you know, we're part of that food chain. Mm. If you can do that, it means that you take carbon dioxide 
out of the water and you mm. store it as organic carbon and that allows more of the atmospheric carbon dioxide to come in. I see, yeah. The other one is that you can change the chemical properties of seawater. So there's a, a thing called alkalinity, which I will mm. not try to explain <laughs> because I probably can't. <laughs> but it effectively controls how much carbon dioxide can be present in seawater as carbon dioxide. Yeah, and so it. there are some marine organisms we might get onto later <clears throat> that can change the alkalinity of seawater and so they can influence how much carbon dioxide can actually get out of the atmosphere mm. into the ocean okay interesting and i get so is is all marine life important here or is it just spe specific types or certain species even that can contribute uh, i think it's fair to say that's an open question mm, okay. there, are, there are clearly some organisms which are more important than others but in terms of the being able to attribute specific uh, sort of amounts to mm. each organism, it's difficult. And part of that is because, as we know, the marine ecosystem is incredibly complicated yeah. and many things are connected. So starting at the bottom, we have phytoplankton, mm -hmm. and those are sort of the, the microscopic plants of the ocean. Mm. We know that they convert as much carbon dioxide into new plant material as all of the land plants, so, you know, whether you go to the Amazon or the prairies, you know, what's in the ocean does the same job each year. And so you could argue that those are perhaps the most important because they mm. are the primary route. That's why they're called primary producers. Yeah. Converting that carbon dioxide in seawater into living material, which then stores carbon in a different form. Mm. That's interesting. What about bigger species? Bigger species? Yes. So, you know, we have sort of quite a lot of interest at the moment in terms of fish for example mm. influencing carbon so one of that one of the ways in which that may happen is in terms of the fish actually moving up and down that's okay. something we might touch on later but one of the one more interesting things i've heard recently is that a lot of fish produce uh carbonate which is essentially like chalk inside their gut mm. and when they release this into the seawater, that actually influences alkalinity. Mm. And so it may be that sort of the process of digestion by fish and releasing material itself can influence the ability of seawater to take up carbon dioxide. And so they're not the only organism that does that. So some of those tiny phytoplankton, coccolithophores, mm. it's a long name, <laughs> but effectively if you, if you walk along the British coast to Dover and you see the white cliffs, mm. Those are just tiny coccolithophores, you know, way back in time that yeah. have been compressed. But once again, when they form those little shells to, prote sorry, to protect themselves, mm. that once again changes alkalinity okay. of seawater. So there are multiple organisms doing multiple yeah. things, which means it's so incredibly difficult to understand yeah. how it all fits together. I was going to say that sounds incredibly complex. There must be so much that we just don't know. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So we've heard about the twilight zone on previous podcast episodes, which is we're talking about that layer beneath the surface. Um, is that important as well for this? Yeah, I mean, the, the twilight zone is a fantastic place. So as you say, it, it begins where sunlight runs out, that, you know, somewhere between 100 and 200 metres, mm. down to about 1,000 metres, by which time it is, you know, just pitch black. Yeah. Um, there are so many things that, you know, we do not know about the twilight zone. Mm. You know, it is you know, home to the sort of the epic struggle of, of the ocean, sort of uh, sperm whale versus giant squid, you know, the thing, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think any wildlife cameraman would like to get on yeah. film. It's never been filmed. The only reason we know it happens is because we find the beaks of giant squids inside sperm whale stomachs. Oh, wow. So we know it takes place, but yeah. nobody's ever seen it. Nobody's filmed it. And so if you have two organisms of that size fighting it out in this region, nobody's yeah. ever seen it. It gives yeah. you an indication of quite how much we do not know. Yeah. Um, and, the, you know, one of the other striking things, which I think you might have mentioned on previous podcasts, mm. is this huge migration of organisms mm. that happens each day. So as the sun goes down, mm. then enormous numbers of fish, little shrimpy things rise to the surface to feed. And they do it at night because they're trying to avoid being eaten. And if it's night, you have less chance. Mm. Um, but what happens is they all feed at the surface and then they move down depth at night. And if they then excrete all of that 
carbon that they've eaten in the surface then it's mm. effectively you know a fast train to the interior yeah. so you take all of that carbon that's been eaten in the surface and you move it down to a thousand meters so potentially it's actually a very efficient way of getting carbon deep into the ocean mm. uh, something that's receiving a lot of attention but obviously you then need to balance it against what happens if you then start to fish those organisms mm. so recently there's been some discussion about should those organisms that are moving up and down be an active fishery Ooh. and the reason for that is because there, there was a study that came out oh, a few years ago now that suggested that they might have well we might have considerably underestimated how many of these fish they were mm. so now we think they may be the most abundant sort of creature with the spine so in a vertebrate so on earth so more in, oh, wow more numerous than chickens or rats whatever you might want enormous numbers of these things mm which obviously draws attention as a potential foodstuff. Yeah. But there's a question, if, if you take those out, do you then risk perturbing what's happening with the carbon system? Mm. And so that's sort of one of the areas of active research that's going on at the moment. Yeah, that's fascinating because I, I can see the draw towards that as a fishery. Like, yes. obviously, at the moment, overpopulation, exactly. overfishing, yeah. trying, to, trying to help with food security and things like that. But then I guess, yeah there's a risk there isn't there overlooking the impacts yeah, on yeah, yeah on the carbon cool that's really interesting so um might it be then that people are looking at marine life to address carbon and um, to address climate change um impacts yes so that is something which has i guess emerged over the last few years mm. in, in a number of different forms so one of the sort of the, the the main motivators behind it is that we know that marine life exerts a strong influence on climate. So at the moment, the influence is quite stable. Now, even though we have this changing climate, mm. the role of marine life in the carbon cycle seems to have been relatively steady over that period. And so most of the carbon that we have released by doing things like burning fossil fuels when that's gone into the ocean, it's gone in through largely sort of physical chemical processes, right. just sort of absorbing in there. But we know if you look back further in time, that life in the ocean has influenced climate quite strongly. Mm. And people have done experiments where, you know, I, I say I come from a modeling group. If you do sort of the, the thought experiment of killing all life in the ocean, mm. we can see that atmospheric carbon dioxide goes up very significantly. Mm. So we know that marine life can influence climate. Mm. And this has led people to think the other way around, which is that can we actually deliberately perturb the marine system so that they take up some of that carbon dioxide that okay. we accidentally put in the atmosphere? Mm. And there are a number of schemes which they call marine carbon dioxide removal, mm. which are precisely that. So one of them is, for example, to put a, uh, a lot of iron into the ocean, which may seem a bit strange. Um, but the reason for that is they're not going to go and dump sort of old cars and tankers into the ocean. It's actually sort of very sort of fine dissolved mm. form of iron. And that's because iron is actually required by all plants to grow. And in mm. particular, a lot of plants in the ocean are in short demand of iron. Excellent. And so one theory is if you just put lots of iron into mm. the ocean, the phytoplankton go bananas, you draw down all of this carbon and everybody is sort of looking at a, a lower carbon climate. But then you have to think about the consequences. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, using nature to tackle climate change, can't. I mean, that sounds quite appealing, but there are probably quite a few risks associated with that. Well, yeah, so this, <laughs> this as I say, you know, it's, it is an interesting idea and mm. it's, it's easy to understand why people are looking at it yeah, because we are in a situation course. where we, we, have, we are going to have to make difficult decisions mm. about climate. And so we obviously need to both understand the natural system in mm. terms of, you know, what was happening before we started perturb things how does the carbon cycle in the ocean work and how mm. does marine life influence it but we also need to understand what happens if we actually try and do that sort of deliberate mm. perturbation and we're talking planetary scale perturbations yeah. this isn't just sort of dump a few things into your local dock this mm. is trying to do things at the scale of oceans yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's a situation that we put ourselves in because yeah. of climate change. You no, know, these are questions we need to pose. And so yeah. you know, there, there are now some quite large projects spinning up mm. to look at this question. First yeah. of all, are these approaches likely to work? Yeah. You know, because there's a question about 
how long if you if you if you persuade the marine life to take up more carbon how long does it stay in the ocean because mm. if they die and the carbon dioxide is released within a few years mm. then you've not bought yourself much yeah. time you need it to stay there for hundreds of years and then there's the other side of it was what do you do to the rest of the ecosystem if mm. you intervene mm. do you change the food web do you change the amount of food going to fish do you change fisheries for example that people yeah. may be dependent on yeah so you have all of these linked aspects which i think we're only really starting to get a sort mm. of a handle on still early days yeah so that i mean there must be so many questions still that um that we have in order to make these decisions yes. i mean talking about the kind of short versus long term kind Absolutely, of yes. impacts and yeah just thinking about all the, all the kind of complex <laughs> differences in the food web and then just thinking about geographically as well if stocks are moving around that could get and, a bit complicated and one of the other interesting things is that because of the scale you have to do it you're now talking about having to do things in international waters. So yeah, exactly. It, you mm. know, you need agreement across yeah. numbers of countries yeah. in order to allow you to do that. And that, you know, that immediately becomes a much more difficult thing to, to organise. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So thinking about the next kind of five years or so, um, how do you see our knowledge of marine life's role in the climate system developing? Um, are there any notable projects working on this? I mean, you just alluded to that maybe there <laughs> yes. are, um, maybe that you can tell us about. Yeah, so I, I think the next few years are going to be very important. And I think that's partly because we have running in parallel this societal need really to yeah. deal with, with climate change. And I, th I think that means that there's going to be a lot of attention on mechanisms by which we can reduce that and as a result on these marine carbon dioxide removal techniques. And so I think as part of that, it's very important that we improve our understanding of the natural system mm. there are still many aspects of how marine life stores carbon in the ocean that we don't fully understand mm -hmm. um, and i think it is you know becoming increasingly pressing that we understand that so that we can understand what happens when we perturb that so in terms of the just what i would regard as the, the three main questions there so first mm. of all is to get a better idea of how marine life might be changing the ability of seawater to take up carbon that's what i mentioned alkalinity yeah. we still have really quite poor understanding of how marine life is changing that mm. and as that is one of the ways in which we influence how seawater takes up carbon dioxide it's obviously very important yeah the second one is to understand what's controlling the conversion of the carbon dioxide in seawater into new living material so that's mm. when we go back to those phytoplankton mm -hmm. the primary producers mm -hmm. You know, our predictions for the future, we don't really know whether the rate at which they're going to be doing that is going to increase or decrease into the next 100 years. You know, mm. our uncertainty is that large. Wow. So we obviously need to address that. <laughs> and then the last one is understanding what happens to all that organic material once it's been produced. Mm. Where does it decay? How does it decay? And how does it come back into the surface so that it can go back into the atmosphere? I think those are the three things that we need to understand yeah. uh, over the course of the next few years. And are there any projects being done at NOC 200 to try and answer these questions? It's funny you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a, um, a NER, what they call a NERC strategic program. So mm -hmm. this is quite a large activity called yeah. Biocarbon, mm -hmm. which has been running a couple of years now. Uh, and that has, I think we have nine projects running in that at present. Mm. Um, and that is specifically to look at this issue of how marine life stores carbon in the ocean in sort of the natural system mm. and so the idea there is that that can inform these discussions that society is going to have in terms of about carbon dioxide removal uh, and so at the moment as we speak we have a cruise out in the north atlantic okay. which is looking into this so yeah. this is the hopefully the culmination of several months if not mm. best part of a year mm. of activity in the atlantic we've had two cruises out there we've had a number of little ro robotic vehicles, mm. including not one, but two, Boatim at Boatface. Ooh. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, and so that is all just trying to piece together what's happening mm. in terms of a full annual cycle. Because yeah. obviously, mm. you know, if you can go walking in the, the woods or wherever and you can see the seasons happen around you, yeah. exactly the same thing happens in the yeah. ocean. And so if you're going to understand how mm. marine life is influencing carbon, you need to study it over that full seasonal cycle. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's so important. Um, and what stage are we at with biocarbon? Near the beginning, near the middle, near the end? 
Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I would say we're probably <laughs> at the middle okay. in, in that we had uh, a little crop of projects early on, which yeah. were sort of setting the scene in terms of looking at things that we could use where we already had data or mm. we could do things in the laboratory. Yeah. At the moment, we're in our fieldwork phase. So that's why we've got all of yeah. this going on. So we've got three projects that are looking into that. Mm -hmm. um, and then further down the line, then the idea is that we have another phase where we try and bring all of that together. Mm. And the idea is we come up with something that we can put into our climate models yeah. so that our climate models become more adept at predicting what happens in the future when we take proper account of marine life. Yeah. Cool. Well, that sounds so interesting. And I really look forward to hearing the results from yeah. Biocarbon. You're welcome. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the podcast. To ensure you don't miss out on future episodes, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. See you next time.